Get down to those nice long lunch lines before all the tasty food is taken. Nah, it'll be fine. But let's get started with this. I want to start off with saying this is a collaborative source control presentation. That means I'm expecting you to, at the very minimum, raise your hand once or twice as I talk. If you never raise your hand, that means you don't do any source control and you also don't feel badly about it. So you should be ashamed. Uh, ideally, you'll be peppering me with questions. Uh, if you want to yell at me about why I'm putting these choices up here, please do. I find that the discussion, the back and forth of, you're an idiot, why'd you put that up there, and I can explain it, is usually much more valuable than a couple of bullet points up on the slide. I guarantee you, you won't offend me. So please, challenge me, make me explain it more, ask questions. Tell me about the ways you did it that worked better. That's great for everybody. I've got no problem with that, please do so. All I'd ask is if you're hiding in the back that you speak up so I can actually hear you. Okay? All right. Let's get started. So my name is Matt Pollock. I'm a senior software engineer in our integration engineering services department. I'm still getting used to that because I've been a systems engineer for quite a while. I think I know about half the room, so hi, everybody. How's it going? Good to see you again. Hi. Let's talk about working together, which might be a little bit alien to most engineers because this is my usual mode. And yes, I have to have an obligatory XKCD, it's required. But this is usually me, working by myself with some headphones on, trying desperately to fix all the things I broke when I was trying to fix the things that I broke and get it all done before I have to ship them in. That's honestly how I usually work. I would imagine most of us can relate to this as well. Um, I find that most software developers in their natural habitat are in this mode. How many of you actually work alone all the time? Not that many. Most of the time, but not always. Have you ever given code to somebody else and they had to work on it? You ever inherited somebody else's? <laughs> How many of you have inherited somebody else's code but have not cursed their name eventually? Not as many hands, okay. So one of the things we're gonna try and focus on here is how not to be that guy. The guy whose code you dread having to take on because you know it's crap, because you know it's gonna be riddled with bugs, because you know you're gonna spend twice as long figuring out why the heck they did things, or where all the files are, as you are trying to get the job done, right? So I like to have this slide in there because, well, there was no XKCD on how engineers can work together. There weren't a lot of funny, quippy web images on this, and I looked. There's not much. So I figured this was a good reason to have this kind of a presentation, because oftentimes we talk about the tools, the build scripts, the low-level, nitty-gritty details, but we forget to talk about how to just work together. So when we get into the presentation, I'm not gonna focus on the tools. I'm not gonna focus on the syntax of a Groovy script. That's what Google is for. We can figure that part out. I'm gonna be focusing more on the processes, the guidelines, the don't forget this thing that will bite you in the neck if you forget it. That's where I'm gonna spend most of the time. And like I said, please, pepper me with questions, make me work for this. Uh, otherwise, we'll be done a little bit early, which might not be a bad thing. So I like to start off these presentations with source code control. Do I need it? And the short answer is yes. Yes, you do. How many of you use source control? How many of you use it as much as you're supposed to? Nah, okay. This is my flossing question. Because it's exactly the same as your dentist asks you every time. Yeah, I floss. No, not as much as I should. Yeah, eventually I'll get around to it, but not really. Next year I'll just say the same thing and be ashamed. A few people do that too. Okay, good. And the other thing I'd like to note here is this. No, no. <laughs> Bad. That is not source control. That is embarrassing. <laughs> but almost all of us have done that at some point or have been on the receiving end of that. Your email client is not your source control provider. <laughs> Neither is that network share you dump these things in. Don't. Everybody's done it, so I'm not even gonna ask you to raise hands about it. Let's just move past that and admit we can do better. But that's where almost everybody starts. And part of that is it's easy, it's quick. I don't have time to set something up. I need to get this to them right now. It's no big deal, it's just this once. This time's different. Mm -hmm. 
If once you get to the point where you don't have any time left to do it right, you're already toast. And honestly, I can't give you guidelines of how to save yourself in that situation. It's the same thing as if you're doing a fixed bid project, you're running 300 hours over. You're done. Good luck trying to renegotiate that. Good luck trying to say, I need more time on my project to go fix the things that should have been there before I bid. No way. You're dead. Do it beforehand. Suck it up for whatever project you're working on now. Feel the pain. Next time, do it right. Let's talk about next time. So, any of you use Git? Perforce. Subversion. All right, so we got a little bit of Mercurium. Hey, all right. Any other random ones out there? Oh, I'm sorry, clear case. What else? Anybody else? <laughs> SVM, yeah, subversion, same thing. Okay, fair enough. So a good variety out there. Like I said, I'm going to try not to focus on tools. When I do get into demos and examples, much like the last presentation, it's going to be on GitHub, just because that's what I have. It's also free, which makes it a nice default choice for those of us who don't have unlimited budgets, which is um, all of you, right? We'll talk a bit about the which one to use, some selection criteria there, but again, I'm not gonna get into tools evangelism. All I'm gonna say is use one. <coughs> Those of you with Git, have you ever had a merge battle? I see some painfully experienced nods happening. So, merge battles. This happens a lot with Git, it happens with others as well. Again, Git's my example that I'm gonna use. This is when you've got multiple simultaneous and conflicting changes to the <laughs> same files by either different people or same person in different branches of the code. Basically, this is when it's not just the old version and the new version. It's the version that was in there, my version that I've been working on for the last week, and Steve's version that he was also working on for the last week. Oops. How do you put them together? And that's where I'm gonna structure most of the presentation around. Just because if you can solve this problem, you solve most of the issues of working together with the source control system. This merge battle problem is a symptom. It's a symptom that you didn't get all the right groundwork in place initially. You don't have the right processes in there. You don't have enough governments, governance excuse me, on what you're doing to avoid this. Which also means you're probably shipping really buggy software. Because if you're not able to manage this case, you're cutting corners. You're in a hurry. You don't have time to do it right. You just got to ship it. Well, be prepared for your phone to ring with that customer saying, hey, it broke. Because odds are pretty good you forgot something else, too. You've all had that phone call before? Nobody's admitting. Yeah. I have. Many times. So the ideal is we want this to not happen. The internet did not fail me here. <laughs> Usually you can judge the extent of an engineer's problem by how funny the stuff online you can find about it is. <laughs> Working alone, no problem. We all got that. Merge battles, oh yeah, the internet's got this. It's a problem. And yeah, let's just watch that. <laughs> so how do we avoid that? Well, we gotta be careful. So rather than just saying some platitudes about you gotta be careful with what you're doing. You have to have good processes. You have to have a process. You have to have a workflow guidelines. None of that helps you. Those are just words. We're gonna go into some specific details that I found that work well for my development. Ideally, you'll chime in with some that worked really well for you as well, and we can share them with everybody. Because if there's anything that engineers hate, it's wasting effort on repeated work. So let's avoid that. I am an incredibly lazy engineer. I don't want to do any work that I don't need to to get that job done the right way. Keyword is the right way. So how do we need to do it? First off, we said it was multiple simultaneous conflicting <coughs> changes. So let's limit the unnecessary changes. Any of you ever have lab you say that your code has changed and you say, no way? Yeah. yeah, we'll talk a little bit about what we can do to help avoid that problem. There's a few things that uh, most of you probably know, but it may be much like flossing. You know you're supposed to, but you forget. Uh, we'll also talk about some LabVIEW architecture decisions you can make that make that job easier. And that's usually going to be centered around not having it all be on the same file. How many of you have 
dealt with a monolith before, and I don't mean 2001 A Space Odyssey. We'll be talking a bit about monoliths. I got a couple of canonical examples of those and how to know if your code is horrible. It should be pretty easy to tell. Uh, also, I'll share the development process that we follow on some of our internal developments that let us stay out of each other's way. And a little advertisement for that. I worked on a framework that has somewhere between three, 4,000 BIs in it, and I've never used ldmerge.exe on it. Those of you that have used it before, you know why that's a good thing. I will only say positive things about our products at MIT Code. <laughs> And last one, when you do have to merge your code together, in those cases where you just can't avoid it, it's not possible to always avoid, but how to make sure you didn't mess it up. Because I don't know about you, but usually I introduce lots and lots of bugs whenever I touch code. I wish I didn't, but honestly I do. And I like to think of it that it just means I'm testing enough, because I can actually catch them. Ideally, I'm the one who's most ashamed of my code because I know all the horrible things I did before it got into the beautiful state I came to my customer. Never let your customer realize how bad of a programmer you are. <laughs> Alright, so step one, organize. My house is a mess, but my code is not. And part of that's because I live in a screen most of the day, I don't know about you, but here's some bad stuff, actually no, you tell me. You probably saw it, but that's okay. What's going to make for horrible, horrible pain in source control with regard to how you lay out your files on disk? I'm not even talking about what's in the files, just where they are, how many there are. What has gotten you before? You've got some. Ooh, putting people putting stuff in vi .lib. Okay, yeah. I'd say stuff that shouldn't be there is the problem. I'll, I'll put some nuance on that later, but I fundamentally agree with where you're going with that. Uh, I'd say nothing belongs in VI Lib that doesn't have a version number and can be installed. Whether it came from NI or whether it came from, say, Levy Tools Network, there's valid reasons for stuff to be there, but you should never be dropping a file in there yourself. Ever. I'd like to add on. And if you're going to have reuse code or add-ons, put it in a place people can find it. I'll throw a little bit more color on that in a little bit, too. But that's a big one. Since, again, I'm a very lazy engineer. I like reuse. Don't put all the VIs in the same one folder. Don't put all the VIs in the same one folder? But how will you find anything? Well, you have some. Oh. Yeah. On the flip side, don't create two deep in the folder hierarchy. Lots of issues with needing to reorganize and find a new file path. Anybody ever have that problem where you have a beautiful hierarchy on disk, but you try to build it and it says the path is too long? It's always fun when you find that out at the end of a project, too. Anybody ever have to reorganize a source control repository? Don't. All right. Top of my list, a monolith. One giant VI that has no sub-VIs, that has all of the code. If you've got three developers and you have one VI, is there any way to avoid a merge conflict? Yes, there is. Have two of them idle. Probably not the most efficient. But that's my canonical, never ever do this. Uh, random VI is just scattered everywhere on disk. Sometimes I accidentally save a file to my desktop. Sometimes I accidentally save a file in the wrong project repository directory. Oops. This happens all the time, but you gotta be real careful about it. And I'll show you a couple of things I do to cheat on that one. Uh, by the way, all these are actual cases I've run into with actual customers, but I've obfuscated the details. Uh, code that you forgot that depends on driver A, B, and C, a modified example you download from ni.com, three old great packages you downloaded but forgot about, a type def you copy from one project to the other, but you forgot to copy the type def, you just copied the VI that came with it, so now you're linked against this thing over here. Or my favorite, this is actually from a customer, including the date range. A reuse library consisting of all of the code from all of your previous projects over the past decade 
copy and pasted as a reuse directory in every new project they make. And it was part of their development process that every project they make gets dumped into this giant reuse directory. Can you imagine the joys of the cross-linking in that thing? Yeah. We spent about six months untangling that disgusting pile of spaghetti. But they were doing it to save time. Because at the time, it was easy. Here's a zip file. Here we go. Same idea here. There were a lot of init.vi's in there. Some of them were not editing the right things. So, better idea. Ideally, your project hierarchy on disk should look something kind of like this. Simple. I know where the project is. It's not 300 VIs in a flat folder next to the project file without any organization or any knowledge of what is what and what I should touch. Uh, I, like, I tend to do a lot of work that's on multiple different targets, RT systems, Camargo systems, oftentimes with the Windows and RT and an FPGA. Usually I'll split them up at that layer. And then I get three developers, one that does the FPGA work, one that does the RT work, one that does the host work. They're safe. They're separate from each other. Yay. And if I need to have five different people working on the FPGA, I might have more of a problem. We'll get more to that in a second. The project itself should look organized. You should be able to know where your code is. Somebody who inherits your code because you're out sick and the project needs to ship next week should be able to know where to find the top level BI. There shouldn't be five of them. The thing that says host main should actually be the main BI. Not the one that was the main guy until you changed your mind and changed your framework and put a wrapper around it. Pick one. And one of the things that I like to mention here, and we kind of mentioned it before, is I like to have all of my code in a that repository directory or subdirectory or vi lib or instrument lib, sure. I use the term generically. What's that? Or it's got to be installed by something into VIA. And my key there is I want to make sure I can replicate this thing on another machine easily, trivially. Pull down the source code and maybe install some set of dependencies. I'm just using as an illustration point VI packages here, but again, I'm not talking tools in this presentation. That could be a text file that says install these five driver versions. Could be something that says pull down the internal package from our reuse repository and install that. Whatever that might be, clear, concise, and updated and correct information on how to reproduce your build set. That's actually one of the things I found screws up developers in multiple projects, excuse me, multi-developer projects, more than anything else, is inconsistencies between the development environments. And you might also notice that on my example, actually mapped to an end drive. I actually do that on my projects. I actually map a drive to whatever subfolder location the repository lives in. Then it's real easy for me to tell if something's not on the end drive, it shouldn't be there. That's just how I tend to work to avoid those conflicts from ever creeping into the project. It's real easy to tell if something's on my desktop, for example. Same thing. Does Live have any published style guide for this? Um, I wouldn't say to the point of ex cathedra, this is the way it must be, but there's a lot of presentation fought like this, there's a lot of white papers we put out. I, I wouldn't say it's codified in any definitive source. How would you like to see it? What we found is every time we've tried this, there's been enough discussion amongst different consumers of that data where everybody's organization does it a little bit differently. There's not one right way to do this stuff, but there are right combinations of ways to do it. But that's why it's a guide, right? Yeah, yeah. I did, and that's a fair criticism. Should there be more? Sure. You want to write it? This is a collaborative source control presentation. No. Uh, 
So when it comes down to simpler projects that aren't maybe using as many distributed targets as an example like this, yep. um, the concept of uh, source distributions. I think a lot of people try them, it fails because a file is missing or a library doesn't have a component or there's usually something that stops you and instantly people hit the eject button on the source distribution process. But I have found that as I've refined the skill in detecting, you know, like, oh, that means of this or this means of that, finding the rogue VIs on the desktop or properly pulling files that might be linked in VILib out of VILib and preserving the right linkages um, is so critical to become a master of doing source distributions you know, in general. I think even as we migrate into the world of NXG eventually, that idea of your project and needing to have more of a distribution aspect to it is, I think, so important that we all need to possibly learn to, even as we like, hey, I've got this small little app that I've made for someone, instead of just taking the directory and popping it to them, no. we need to realize the type def is missing, right? Well, and then here, oh, here's that file. Oh, wait, I have to put it in the right directory. Just by de facto, even for simple things, getting in that habit of making that quick and dirty source distribution just for that individual one, individual instance that you need to share that chunk of code because of that refining of your own skills to get over the humps of the problem of, you know, some conflict, some issue in the distribution is so key. So yeah. it helped me a lot in this process. So source distributions having troubles building because it can't find all the files, that's another symptom of the same cause. That you weren't careful enough in getting things set up, or you weren't diligent enough to catch things that crept in. Uh, your code is going to rot. The longer it's used, the more people touch it. You got to keep paying attention. Um, I personally am a more bigger fan of VI packages and source distributions, but again, that's a tools discussion more than an architecture. Well, the funny thing about the, just the, the packages, building an EXE, building a DLL, building a pack project library, the very first thing that all of those things do, even in like JKI's pack project, is they make a source distribution yep. internally. So if you're having a problem with any of the tools actually doing what we think they need to do, that's why I was going to refining that at the yep. lowest level. You've been very patient. Uh, I was going to say, if you're looking for um, kind of like a starting point on how to uh, follow a lot of these ideas so that you can easily move uh, your code from place to place, actually you can look at uh, NI certification exam instructions because that happens to you know come on a USB stick, you're programming on one computer, and in order to be tested successfully, it has to work on somebody else's computer. So they give you specific instructions about how to lay out your uh, file hierarchy and lay out your project and so on. And so those are just a few very key and important concepts that you should incorporate regardless of what other method you're using. Yep. And uh, that would be a good place to at least start. Good recommendation. Also good to see you. You do. <laughs> So I want to point out something else also and that I tend to see a lot of folks forget about along the same veins. And I love the conversation. We'll keep it going. I do have to play a little bit of the MC role and keep things moving along. But we can always talk at lunch later if you'd like. Uh, one of the things that I'm very much a fan of, it, especially to get rid of those phantom changes, I won't say get rid of them, but reduce them. How many of you are aware of the option to separate uh, compiled code from source files? How many of you use it? Some of you don't. Is there a strong reason in your organization why not? Uh, we're into a case where we wanted to start launching VIs dynamically at runtime. Uh -huh. That's fair. So that is my key one at the end there of don't deliver source code without an export. These, what this thing does is normally a .vi file on disk contains both your source code and the compiled object binary in the same file, which is fine if you are working on one target. However, as soon as you drag it to a different place in your project, say an RT target, like 32-bit, like 64-bit, for example, as well, it's going to have to recompile that and change the file on disk. Even if you didn't touch the diagram or the front panel, just by mere fact of opening it in a different context will result in the VI having changes, unless you choose to separate the source code out. In which case, on that local machine, once it's opened in a particular context, it will cache separately on disk from the VI file, the compiled object code. So if you open it on that computer for 32-bit library windows, it'll compile it for that. 
If on that computer you open it for 64-bit lobby windows, it'll compile it for that and keep both. Open it up on a RT PXI system in your project, it'll compile it for Farlab. Open it on a compact Rio with Linux, it'll compile it for that. You'll have four different versions in that case. However, if you take the VI file off of disk and put it on a PXI system and say, call that dynamically and run it, there's no, sort, no compiled code in there at all. It can't do anything. So you have to make sure you're actually doing an export out. Source distribution, exe build, whatever, to get it out of your project. No copy and pasting from your source repository to a deployment machine in that case. Testing and deployments, this can really bite you. Because it'll work until you stop using the development system adapter. Once you switch to runtime, everything's broken. But only once. Because once you open the development environment on that machine, on that specific machine, the problem will go away. Phantom bug, our favorite. If you ever had that case happen, where an error happened once, and then as soon as you open it to look at it, your bug disappeared, it's a nice Heisen bug, that might be the root cause. Especially if it then comes back on another machine the first time. I've been bitten by that repeatedly, and a number of my customers have also. I still find it's worth it, because just being able to avoid having 300 files claim that they've changed, even though I didn't actually make any changes to them, it keeps my source control history much smaller, it makes it much easier to manage my projects. I find that this requirement is worth it for me. Not everybody may agree, that's fine. But I find that's very useful for myself. And there's a setting in the project properties where you can set it for anything in that project. New, new, any new BI is in there, and there's also this button to go in and see if there's anything in your project that is incorrectly marked. So if you have yourself in that situation where you deploy and there's been weird problems, you might want to go check. Pick one or the other, combining both is a problem. So, how to do this. First order of business is start with something clean. Before I write any code, I make folders on disk. Just because it forces me to not be in that situation of I'm in too much of a hurry now, I can't do it. I'll just put it in the top level and hope I remember to move it later. Also, Everybody ever use the Files tab of Project Explorer? This is your best friend when trying to see what the heck is crosslinked on my system. And I've actually got an example of this in a second, uh, where I will make you find where I messed up a project. Because you've probably done exactly the same thing. Other piece is if you don't want to be looking at your code to see if it follows the right rules, the AI Analyzer can do this work for you. There are the AI Analyzer tests that can verify this. If you don't feel like running VI Analyzer all day, or on every commit to your source control, which, let's admit it, we probably won't do that, make Jenkins do that. Or insert tool of your choice here. Uh, it's very possible to automate VI Analyzer from a continuous integration system. As long as you can call something via command line, somehow, you can do it from a CI, a CI system. And I've got a very, very beta disclaimers package that's up that can also take VI Analyzer test results and convert it to the same style used for the Jenkins check style plug. Which means in the Jenkins UI I can get a report of all the things that I recently screwed up since the last build. And it will maintain its own history via the check style plugin in Jenkins. There may be check style plugins for others, I don't know. But it'll maintain a history of I newly created this problem. This one newly resolved this problem. Without me having to manage or track that. Like I said, I'm lazy. I want to do my, have my tools do the work for me, but it's impossible. So just for a fun exercise here. Here's a VI, let's remember that for the moment. So here's a nice looking project. It's fairly well organized, at least I hope so. It's one that I'm uh, working on at the moment. But I had messed something up in here. I had crosslinked myself by accident. I've got my end drive here. And that's just got my specific project and repository root. I know because there's no other folders in here, I didn't mess up anything from amongst my other projects. I've got things in VI lib, no problem. Instrument lib, fine, those are installable. I can put that in a dependencies file. Menus, eh, all right, but what's this? What's this? Why do I have this here? Why, I did not put the, oh no, I forgot to type that. 
I don't know that on somebody else's machine they didn't change that type of. Maybe they edited an enum because they had some project three years ago that they were working on and now their code works differently than mine, even though it's the same source. I should have not depended on something in the examples folder, but made my own version of that and put it in my project directory. This is a really quick and easy way to find out, did I screw something up? If it's not in your project repo and it's not in GI lib or instrument lib, sure, you messed up. Pay attention, find them early before there's 3,000 of those. One of these is easy to fix. Yeah. What about users? Do you have something on your desktop? Do I have something on my desktop? That got introduced in the last hour. Okay. Um, ignore. Ignore that. Okay. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> See, this is my point about diligence. They creep, the code rot creeps in. Even if you're not intending it, it'll get in there. Even if the best intentions, it'll happen. So I'll just pretend that was intentional in a learning mode. Thanks. All right. So back up to where we were. It's not code. I love this picture. I love using this one. So that's a monolith. I can't unsee that, Matt. <laughs> this should haunt your nightmares forever, Alan. But I know you don't write code this way, so you're fine. This is what I'm talking about for a monolith. This is the canonical extreme example of nasty LabVIEW code. If you search Google for ugly LabVIEW code, you get this. I know this because that's what I did. And we use it in presentations all the time because this is nasty. Imagine you trying to figure out between four other people how to work on this piece of code together without breaking it. How's this even supposed to work? How do you know if it broke? You're doomed. Don't have this. Please don't have this. This is impossible. You are doomed. Have something like this. Nothing on the top level, really, except for a couple of sub VIs that can be easily farmed out to different developers with a clear interface between them. Uh, again, I'm not trying to get into the specific nitty gritty details of, for example, which message passing architecture to use, DQMH versus Actor Framework. I'm not going there. But what I'm saying is, Make it such that you design your code with discrete individual functions that can be tested individually and don't depend on each other, at least to the minimum extent possible. Uh, keep the dependencies to the minimum extent possible. Keep the isolation to the maximum. Ideally, you should be able to touch almost all parts of the code by two different people without them even noticing, so long as they don't touch the same files. If you have enough files on disk, organized well enough, then it makes that pretty easy to keep yourselves from getting into conflict and still maintain parallel work philosophy so you can actually get this thing done. Yeah? Uh, you might get into this later, but you know, two people can work on different files from the same class. You have a little change of class file. Yep. There is a nice advantage to class files, LVLib files, and LVProj files. They're XML. Source control systems do pretty good at doing through a merges on XML files. So I find that if I put the pain at that level, it's significantly reduced versus trying to do through a merge on a big VI. You can't get rid of all the pain. That's not possible. But we can at least minimize it. So you deal with pain at that library level and you just actually Correct. I try as hard as I can, and we'll get to the workflow in about five minutes, of not working on the same file at the same time. I try and stage my work with other people such that we might both be working on the same files, but not at the same time. I'm going to finish mine, you'll rebase the mine, and then make a change. That's my ideal element. Classes and libraries should be treated as, as monolithic work units. Okay, here. Classes and libraries should be treated as monolithic work units. If you haven't organized True. your classes and libraries that way, then you've probably got a code partition problem. Agreed. I mean, I should be able to say, you know, Matt, you have, you know, this actor library, go work on it. I'm going to go work on a different one. Yep. I, I specifically speak for the case where I have a class that's got methods. I'm working on method A, someone else is working on method B, and we need to put both those changes in. It's not ideal. It would have been better if we could assign that as one work unit. I've been in cases where ideal is not possible. Fair so enough. in that case, I take the pain of merging XML versus VI. Fair enough. But your point is well taken. This should have been 
Speaking of which, aha! So, who uses classes? Yay! Who has ever had to re-architect their class hierarchy in source control? Ooh, was it fun? No. If you like that sort of thing, maybe it's fun, but I don't think so. Um, I've had worse experiences in my life. I believe that. I'm not sure I remember which ones, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're great, for, especially for partitioning the work into discrete units, separate classes that can be assigned separately, and worst case, separate methods within the same class if you really have to. Not just one giant monolithic VI. But it puts a lot of files on disk, it enforces problems when you have to manage where those are. If you make changes as to what's supposed to be in a particular class, and you re-architect your hierarchy, you probably need to move stuff around the disk a lot. Source code control systems don't like that very much. It hurts. It also will slow you down and introduce bugs if you're managing that instead of managing your application. This is my own personal rule of thumb, but usually my first two designs of a a uh, class hierarchy for a new system, for a new design, usually the first two I make are crap, and I need to throw them away. But I don't know that they're crap until I've actually built one, figured out why it was bad, throw it away, build another one, figure out why it was bad, throw it away. Usually the third one is the one that I actually go with. Some of my Python sketch with the strongest castle in the end. Yeah. Uh, that's for me, that's what works for me. And this might be complete heresy in this kind of presentation, but for a new class design, usually I won't even commit it to source control until I've thrown away at least one version. Because I know I'm gonna get rid of it. And the sooner I can get it done, the better. Uh, that's part of my design process. I'll prototype it, throw it away, do a stub design after that, throw it away, then actually get into it. Your mileage may vary, that's what works for me. Anybody else similar in that regard? Yeah? I, I, I won't necessarily commit a new class or set of classes I'm working on until I play with them for just a little bit and decide I'm happy with them. Uh, yes. You know, it's, that's, yes, there's the potential for loss there, but it's it's localized. Yep, fair. And like I said, your mileage may vary. That's what works for me. Um, how many of you are introverts? Actually, let me put that in a different way. Raise your hand if you're an extrovert. Huh? <laughs> hey, there we go. Not a ton, which is not that surprising uh, in this type of crowd. I'm incredibly strong introvert. I'll probably go hide in a cave for an hour after this presentation. That's just how I am. But sorry, uh, fellow introverts, but one of the only ways we can avoid conflicts is we gotta communicate. You have to talk. You might be able to get away with just typing, which helps me, uh, but you can't just work on things in isolation with multiple people and expect things to work out just fine. It is not going to happen. You have to have some way to, first off, know what you're supposed to work on, who's working on what and when, and also keep a backlog of what work you need to do, your task assignments, your issues lists, your bug lists, with some linkage back to the code. And no, the answer is not an Excel sheet on your network share. I say that because I've worked with multiple customers where that was their answer. And it kind of worked, except when it didn't and it was very inefficient. Have, have you ever been in that scenario? Some, yeah. It was awesome, wasn't it? Well, yeah. in, initially it was what we had and it was a whole lot better than, than what the alternative. Yeah, absolutely. We always use the best tools that we have available that make sense for a project. Managers love Excel, it's true. Uh, speaking for every manager I've ever had, if you could put it on Excel or something that could be called a dashboard, yeah. my manager was happy. Doesn't matter if it was actually anything resembling a dashboard, but if you could put dashboard in the title and make some kind of chart, awesome. Um, I don't like spending my time doing that, so I'd rather have a tool do those things for me. And there's a very large number of tools and hosting providers that provide these kind of services out there for me. Like I said, I'm not going to evangelize a tool. I'm going to evangelize use a tool. Whatever works for your organization, whether you need private ones or they can be public, uh, if you can do cloud repos, you've got free options up to a point with all of these. Budget is usually not a good excuse for why you're not using good tools for this. Not anymore. 
And if you work in the defense industries or regulated environments where you can't put things on the cloud, then you better have budget. Otherwise, you've got a problem. Usually on-site hosting is where they really rake you over the coals in these things. I find that most alliance partners, not all, but most, are usually in the mode where we've got five or less developers and or projects that aren't ITAR classified. Most of our projects tend to be around that area. I see some smiles. I'm guessing you work on ITAR. I'm sorry. I do too. <laughs> uh, personally, with my work, I use GitHub and Visual Studio Team Services. Stuff that can be public, I put on GitHub. Stuff that has to be in a secure environment, we pay big bucks for, so I use that tool. Both surprisingly similar, actually. Um, shockingly similar, I'm surprised nobody got sued. But it's actually very interesting. Uh, the key thing here is that you can integrate your work management, your project scheduling, your bug releases, your code versions, and have them all in the same place, along with documentation and hat links to everything. In your commit to source control, you can close an issue and have it documented in the issue without having to go back and do it. Or you could use an Excel sheet on a network share and have to remember to go in there and set it to resolve, which you're not going to do. You can keep a burden out list of all the open issues for a release, and it does it for you. I'm a humongous advocate of having a tool. If you aren't using one, look into it, please. It's going to save you a humongous amount of time because there are quite literally millions of other developers doing exactly the same things you are. Even if they're not doing it in LabVIEW, they're still trying to solve these same problems. And there's tools out there to do it. Please don't reinvent this. Please don't. And before I get too much in there, GitHub people, Bitbucket, GitLab, hey, right. Visual Studio Team Services, Excel Sheet, Ah, subversion with something cobbled together with Jira. <laughs> and any other combinations out there that people are actually working with? Subversion of Redmine. Subversion of Redmine, sure. Um, usually, for my purposes, I find any time we can have the code versioning system and the issue management system in the same place, you start seeing very nice benefits. Uh, it keeps your developers or yourself in one tool instead of having to update and keep in sync two or three separate tools, which we won't do. I'm too lazy. I forget. I make a mistake. All right. In your code, everybody use bookmarks? Not everybody? Oh, come on. Uh, this is one of the things I do basically as a release checklist in my code, or if I know I've put in a landmine in my code that I'm going to go need to defuse later. I'll put a bookmark, just make a label with pound something, or hashtag something. Yeah. Okay. And like you hear, for example, I'll put a note in there so I don't fail a code review, saying I'm deliberately not passing the error out because I want to just report it and not fail. I want to actually run everything in here. Anytime you're doing something that breaks your internal style, you should have a comment in there that says why. And yes, you should have an internal style guide. If you don't have one, talk to Sam. He's built them. He'll evangelize that for an hour. Uh, for me, I like to do this both so if anybody inherits my stuff, they can open the bookmark manager and see the breadcrumbs I left for them. I also like doing this as a pre-release uh, activity to go in there and make sure there's nothing that says bug or to do in my release code. Sometimes I might forget to put it in my bug tracker. I'd use this as a safety net for myself. And this one was a really short slide, but you should be putting comments with your source control commits. Say what you actually did, not updated file name with the file name that Git could already tell you. Yeah, thanks. Tell me fix bug number 27. That's better. Tell me um, re-architected this to do this because of this. Yay. That'll actually help. Keep your commits small. You don't want to be committing in 300 files with the comment of updated things. <laughs> yes, I've seen that commit, and I had they introduced a bug. And it was a really, really hard time for them to go in and find out why. And almost all of those tools will have some means by which, when you do your commits, you can link back into the issues list. For example, again, just for sake of argument, GitHub, if I type in my git commit, fixes number 27, it will actually find issue number 27 in that repository 
and market this fix for me. And I have to go in there and look. It's fantastic. Almost all of them have some feature like that. Take advantage of it. It will save you a lot of time. Speaking of saving a lot of time, I'm lazy. I like to automate everything. How many of you were in the session right before this? Good amount. Okay. Uh, how many of you are staying here through Thursday? Okay, cool. I'm not going to go deep into continuous integration tool chains here. We actually have an entire day of that on Thursday. Soak it up then. They've got lots more information that I can put in five minutes here. Short answer. You should be testing your code. You should know if it broke. You should know when it broke. You should know what broke it. You should know who broke it. You have to hope that wasn't you. If you automate your testing such that every time you do a commit into your source control, it runs through a set of tests, it can be as simple as running a VI analyzer test. Is there anything in this project with a broken right arm? That's enough. Because that's 80% of it right there. Could be much more in depth. A bunch of full unit test suites, integration test suites, whatever makes sense for your organization. I'll claim that nobody in here can argue with me that checking if you broke anything is not worth your time. Because if you can catch it on the single commit of five files that broke something three levels up, it's going to be pretty easy to see which of those five files did it. Instead of 300 files where updated things was the commit. Don't do that. Other thing that we do for the projects I work on is in your source control system, there's typically an option available that will make it such that you can protect certain branches of your code. For example, in Git, you can protect the master branch. Nobody is allowed to commit straight to the master branch because you might have broken it. You get to commit to your feature branch, test it there, and if and only if you didn't break anything, you can merge it into the master. You can actually set that on the source control provider level. You can also set it such that you're not allowed to commit anything unless somebody else says it's okay. Code review. It puts an enforced gate in there that doesn't let you cut corners. Because when it gets busy, that's usually when our code doesn't get reviewed. That's also usually when our code needs to be reviewed. Don't let yourself off the hook. Put in that role in the source control system and make it do it for you. For example, this is the. Oh, I'm not even showing that on the screen. Here is a GitHub page for a pull request on the DCAP project, distributed control and automation framework, the thing I work on that I use GitHub. Somebody wants to make a pull request, they made a change. Well, every time they commit to it, we have our Jenkins server going in and trying to build it. It broke something. I cannot press this button to merge it into the master, even if I wanted to. I can't do it, because it broke something. You have to go back and fix it, and somebody's gotta go back and review it before I can break the main code base that my customer gets to see. Protect yourself before you mess yourself up. Otherwise, it's going to happen. You're going to break the trunk, you're going to break the bills, you're going to break master, and you never want to be that guy. Uh, a customer I worked with for many years, and if you broke the build, you got a life-size cutout of Justin Bieber placed at your desk until you fixed your problem. Uh, shame is very effective. Uh, even more effective is prevention. And setting that up was a matter of two check boxes in GitHub. GitLab has similar features, I, Visual Studio Team Services does. I can't speak for others, but I presume they do as well. And if they don't, consider using a different tool. Okay. Questions so far? We got about five minutes to go. How are we doing? All right. Yep. I have a question on branches. Branches. Um, one of the different is you have multiple branches and people, you know, Miscommunication ended up working on the same BI. Can you run into that merge way down the road where maybe there was a plan of development? Whereas, suppose if you didn't use branches, you probably find that out a lot sooner. Do you have any experience? I do. Um, let me talk about that when I show the workflow that we use, because that'll answer specifically what we do to address that case. Okay. So, we'll be there about a minute and a half.
Pipelines, they're great. Come to the sessions on Thursday. You'll learn lots about them. Key thing I want to put the bug in your ear about though, it is possible to integrate LabVIEW with them. It's possible to automatically run all unit tests, whether they be from VI tester, Karaya, unit test framework, whatever. Possible to run a set of VI analyzer tests and maintain reporting on each single commit that you make. And it's not that hard to set up. A lot of times people don't do this because they don't know that it is possible. It is possible. Come on Thursday to all those sessions that people are putting out, find out how. And the question came up in the previous session, if some of you were in here, about how to get Jenkins or other continuous integration services to talk to LabVIEW. Uh, basically, Jenkins can invoke anything that can be invoked from a command line. And to that, I can only say, come to the keynotes. We might have something for you. I'm not allowed to divulge new features. Hopefully that answers that. All right, so the workflow, as promised. The way that we work with our uh, code for the DCAP project that has let us avoid uh, lvmerge.exe over 3,000 VIs. This is how we did it. So again, Git and GitHub as the tool of demonstration but not required for the workflow. First order of business, we track all of the work that we do against issues or feature requests in our tool. I can't go in and change the code unless there's a reason I'm doing it. If I have a reason I'm changing the code, it has to be documented first. Otherwise, we can't track it. Second, I create a new branch off of master. Your workflow might be off of a version number release. Again, don't want to get too much detail there. The key thing is we branch off, we set our work item to in work, and we work in the branch, never in the master itself. Master's protected. You can't touch it unless it passes all the tests. And the key one that we use to address yours Branches are short-lived. You're working in a branch for days, not months. You do your work and you get out of there and you get it into master as soon as everything works. This doesn't always work well in the real world because sometimes it takes weeks to get something done. Ideally, in those cases, you're building new infrastructure, not reworking existing infrastructure. So if you've got clean separation within your project hierarchy and your code, it should be a matter of making a new child class, a new library in there, that at the end you're gonna drop one change onto the top level of the eye to call that thing, and that's it. That's my ideal there, is that I'm not touching the common code for long. And I only do that at the end, right after I rebase to what was ready there. Commit frequently, by frequently I mean a couple times a day, maybe once an hour, I'm that frequent with my commits. I tend to squash my commits when I roll them into master so I don't pollute the hierarchy. But for my own local machine where I'm making changes, I'll commit as soon as I have something that I want to not lose. If I'm not happy if my computer runs out of battery and nukes my file, I commit it to source control. Livy's done much better in this regard with auto-saving, but I will say it's not perfect. So trust but verify. Livy can save me, but I'll try and save myself. and the server will test everything for me. Once it's ready for review, not necessarily integration, I make a pull request. This is getting to get terminology, but basically at that point, I've made a bunch of changes, they may not even be done yet, but I'm ready for somebody else to look at it and give me feedback. At that point, everybody on my team gets an email and says, hey, somebody needs review on this thing. We can see in the pull request, the changes that they made, we can see, did it build, did it pass unit tests, if it didn't build and didn't pass unit tests, we don't bother reviewing it, we just let them fix it until it's ready for us to actually look at it. And once it can pass everything and somebody's gone in there and said, okay, no, review. That's the point when we can merge it into the master branch itself. For us, by making these branches short-lived and by maintaining good separation of code hierarchies, we're not working on the same files at the same time. And even indication of scope, we have on the order of 50 different repositories with uh, about 12 developers at any given time. Excuse me, at the high world mark uh, that we're working with. Typical is about four at a time. With that, we were able to get out of each other's way enough to build a gigantic system and improve the quality and improve the velocity on it. For us, it was a very good experience. Uh, again, your mileage may vary, but it is possible. 
And of course, once you're done, you actually mark on the work item that's done, you track that it's done, and then the, my manager can see the nice dashboard that says they did stuff. They like that. And two bits left, and then we're done. Releases, if you've got a continuous integration tool chain, getting a release made is just one more stage in the pipeline. It should be easy, because ideally, if you're following that kind of a process, nothing gets into the master branch that you're building that breaks anything that you're looking at. If you have a good set of tests, if you have good uh, checks on your process, once it gets into master, it could go out, in theory. Typically, what we do instead is we'll have some form of manual check at the end, just to make sure they get a hand test on before we get it out to a customer. But that's our basic process, and then you can push it out wherever you want to put it, whether it's SFTP, not FTP. Uh, Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, GitHub, whatever. And it's just another step in the process, and it can be automated as well. If you call from a command line, you can automate it. All those things can be automated very easily. That means that you can go from a bug report on GitHub, in the case of VCAF, to getting a work item assigned, to making a new branch, making a change, rolling it in, getting unit tested, getting build tests, getting integration tests, and getting a package out. That took us about 12 hours, start to finish, and that was because we were sleeping in the middle of that 12 hours. It's possible. You gotta do a lot of work up front to get the infrastructure, but you can do it. Before I get to any other closing questions, some recommendations to see other stuff. If you want details on the usage and setup of LB Merge and LB Compare uh, Fabiola's got a really nice video uh, that's up on NI.com for how to set up your environments and how to work with the tools. It's also a very good introduction if you want to learn more about what those merge problems are. She does a very good job of that. Also, some other sessions you might be interested in up here. Uh, organize your code while you screw up your project. That's, I love that title. It's so true. Uh, also, if you want to get deeper into how you can use Variant Analyzer, uh, Costa from my team is going to be presenting that on Tuesday. And Thursday, all day, in Room G, we're talking continuous integration. That's why I didn't go into too much detail here. I'm kind of hand wavy about it, because you'll get all the information you can handle on Thursday. Right. And if you want some of those packages I've got, they're up there. Otherwise, I want to do it this way. If you want to get to the lunch line, go. If you want to stay and ask questions, please ask. But before you leave, please fill out my survey so that my manager will let me do this again next year. Thank you very much.